Welcome to another episode of Power Athlete Radio. Are we rolling? Are we rolling? Oh, yeah. Uh, we're rolling. Yeah, we always are fucking rolling. Okay. All right. Hey, welcome to another episode of Power Athlete Radio. I'm John Wellborn. I'm joined by Mr. Chris McQuilkin. And I'm crying. Uh, you should be crying because this is going to be a fucking hilarious podcast. Uh, we have this thing called the Power Athlete Hotline, and we field questions from people. And you know what? It can be just about anything. anything. Sometimes we get stuff on training. We get stuff on nutrition. We get stuff on clothing. We get stuff on uh, uh, how to rebuild You know, 12-valve P-pump diesel trucks. Is a NB4500 better than a G56? I mean, we Building got a, your own garage gym. Building your own garage gym. I mean, building your own barn office podcast room. I mean, we got a ton of stuff. Uh, branding hammers over there for our Block One coaches. I mean, we have a, a wide variety of coaching coming from this podcast room via mm -hmm. questions from the hotline. And if you want to reach out to that hotline, 929-464-464. Zero. 929-ing-ing. -ing zero. zero. So reach out, leave us a question. Text, voicemail, you yeah. name it. Uh, the only thing we can't get is smoke signals. So we can get pictures, just don't. God, I hope we get some pictures. No. Send pictures immediately and just label them for text. <laughs> I mean, you know, uh, you know, if, if text gets the occasional dong picture, I mean, you know, we're going to probably repost it. What do you think, Charles? We'll put that on your OnlyFans. Hashtag short king. Hashtag short king. Speaking of short kings. Can I, I, you know, I know that uh, I'm not a short king. <laughs> But I feel like an honorary short king. because Will Chamberlain out. would call you a short king. <laughs> uh, Half Thor might call me a short king. Half Thor is like 6'9". You know what? Uh, regardless of this banter, we decided to fire up and do a crew-only episode because we got such a burner coming in from the hotline. <laughs> so we're going to go to the hotline. It got text in. McQuilkin, please read. I'm in tears. Here we go. Hey, Power Athlete Radio. I just got done watching some videos by... The Short King, a.k.a. The Liver King, a.k.a. Brian Johnson, and not the lead singer of ACDC, which would actually be cool AF because I love ACDC. Anyway, this 5'2 Short King eats raw testicles and pancreas. Is there any benefit to eating raw meat or organs as it relates to the Power Athlete template for performance? I know you are buddies with Rob Wolf and Matt Lalonde, and they for sure have an opinion on this cartoon character. Ooh, well, so where do we go from here? All right, well, let's jump in. Um, uh, a lot I, to unpack. I was not familiar with who the Liver King was, but we had to do a little bit of a dive on him. Um, he is a short king. He's very um, got a big beard, no chest hair, which seems odd to me. Um, but, uh, you know, obviously the guy's uh, in excellent shape, fucking jacked. I don't believe that, uh, you know, the physique he built was necessarily crafted in the way that he's going, but who gives a shit? I mean, the guy's in good shape. What is a little strange, let's get into like the e the raw eating of meat. I mean, it's pretty well established that we evolved not because, you know, of eating raw meat, but actually cooking and making the meat more bioavailable as it cooks. Mm -hmm. But there is some benefit to actually eating raw liver. Um, I actually had a conversation not too long ago, probably a couple of weeks ago, actually with Matt Lamont, oddly enough, and Rob Wolf. We went to dinner after Rob was on Joe Rogan's podcast for Sacred Cow. May we take one moment to introduce the resume of Mr. Lalonde? Yeah. So Matt Lalonde, what episode was Matt Lalonde on Power Athlete Radio? It was early. And I'm pretty sure it's the last podcast Matt was ever on. So much so that I've had people over the last five or six years hit me up trying to get Lalonde on. The problem is... Uh, he's a misanthrope, doesn't like to talk to people, and oddly enough, still picks up my phone calls when I call him. 79. Ooh, episode 79. If you want to go back and check it out with Dr. Matt Lalonde. Now, Matt's a PhD at Harvard, uh, extremely intelligent guy, probably one of the most intelligent people I've ever met in terms of nutrition. So if I ever need something to pass a litmus test, I just dial up old Lalonde, or, or Rob for that matter, and I always ask. Uh, we, and... We actually have a, a very interesting experiment with liver. Uh, I remember years ago when we started eating liver, and I think it came somewhere right around um, the podcast we did with the forage agronomist Peter Ballerstock or Ballerstead. Mm -hmm. uh, we started eating liver. Luke actually jumped in on the liver, and he came up with a pretty good idea. Put it in the freezer and then pull it out, and then while it's frozen, cut it into cubes and eat like an ounce or two once a week, which was more than enough. McQuilkin, on the other hand, decided to eat liver, what was it, every day, every other day? Four days a week. 
So four days a week, you, you were eating how much liver? I mean, maybe four to six ounces. So four to six ounces. A and day. then a day for like a couple times a week. Then we got our blood work done by our buddies at Thorne. Well, no, this no. one was actually we, we had both Thorne and I went to Dr. Tom. Okay. So you went to Dr. Tom. With Dr. Tom. He sh- shined the light. Yeah. So on my one, Krebs cycle. one of the tests came back and Chris had his Krebs cycle. And even though he was not low carb, the amount of liver that he was eating was actually creating vitamin A. Was it vitamin A or vitamin K? It was vitamin A. Vitamin A toxicity. Uh-huh. And you were pretty much hacking your Krebs cycle and you were in ketosis. Yes. Even though you were eating like mm. a few hundred grams of carbohydrates a day. Yeah. Uh, I would say eating not paleo, just eating normal. Uh, you know, throwing some bread, some rice in there, no big deal, but four nights of liver per dinner. And my only justification, not for health reasons, was, it was just cheap. so damn cheap. Uh, you know what? You're, you fucking lost me. So once a month, my mom used to make liver and onions. And the only way you could actually get the liver taste out once you cook it is with the onions. They had another deal where you could soak it in milk. But I remember the onion would actually cut the liver taste. I actually like it raw and I still eat raw liver. So what I do is I put the uh, liver in the freezer, pull it out once a week. I cut it into cubes. I weigh about an, you know two ounces, ounce and a half, two ounces, and I just eat so them in little tiny cubes. Swallow it like a horse pill. Yeah, just fucking swallow it whole. And uh, if you got to chew it, it's not bad frozen, um, and that's more than enough. So I mean, uh, a liver is um, probably the most conscious or sorry concentrated source of vitamin B12 that you can get. So just one ounce of liver has a massive dose of vitamin A, a uh, series of B vitamins, um, and then which would be like B2, which is uh, riboflavin. Then you got B3, niacin, B5, which is panthothenic acid. And then we got B6, B12, folate. And then liver is also one of the most important dietary sources of copper, and as well as providing su- significant amounts of selenium, phosphorus, and iron. So the, the irony of it all, I was still low in iron. So, so this is an interesting point that actually I called Lalonde on, uh, Lalonde, and I wasn't able to verify this through any research, but this is what Matt told me. He said that the cooking of the liver actually does something to the iron that makes it undigestible. So it does something to the body where your body can't digest the iron. That's why he recommended the eating of the raw liver. So that would be an interesting task if you went back and made raw liver, how it would go. So there is benefit. And also uh, Weston Price, who, you know, if you guys know anything about the Weston Price Foundation dentist uh, back in the day who had, uh, I think his son died of a tooth abscess and became obsessed with the idea of tooth decay, went out and searched all these, you know, uh, prehistoric type tribes that hadn't been touched by modern uh, diet. Mm -hmm. And uh, every one of the traditional cultures he looked at consumed liver and other organ meats. And they all had superior bone health and, you know, dental health. And they were, you know, fucking crushing it. And there's some, if you guys Google it, you can see all the pictures. But uh, the interesting piece, and I, I always go back. Uh, years ago, I did a, a talk with um, Lauren Cordain and Rob Wolf when we started Paleo Brands. And bef- the night before, as we were going over our talks, Lauren. And what conference was this at? Oh, this was actually at the launch of Paleo Brands. So Paleo Brands was the food company that Joe Capucho, myself, and Rob Wolf started which was all the dope jerky that mm-hmm. became Well Food Co. Well, we kicked it off. We had this big conference. We had Lauren Cordain come down and sp- uh, speak. And the night before, Lauren pulled out his computer and he was showing us all these pictures that he had collected over the years, one of which was um, um, some like early 1800s uh, buffalo hunters. And they had some Native American, I forgot the tribe, um, and they, they actually took black and white pictures and showed they, they showed this huge bowl. And in front of it, these guys were standing there with rifles and there was two Native American guys and their whole faces and chests were covered in blood. Mm-hmm. And on the back of the picture, there was a notation that said um, whatever the tribe was, like uh, the Dakotas or whoever, I, I can't remember for the life of me, but it said, um, you know, engines consumed four to five pounds of, uh, I think it was like raw liver. As soon as they killed. So I guess they shot the bull. They went in with knives, cut out the liver, and then they feasted and, and consumed all the liver. Because I guess that was what they wanted. Crazy. So, and they were just, and so it was kind of a wild picture. But there was this idea that the organ meats were the most prized pieces for it. And then, the, you know, obviously the muscle meat became later. So there is benefit to consuming raw liver. Now, how much? Uh, one day a week should probably get you there. Uh, if you're liver king and you're consuming it. Um, I have eaten sweetbreads 
Um, I usually throw them in a crock pot with uh, either some um, green chipotle sauce or barbecue sauce. I mean, I've cooked them and they're fine. I'm not uh, necessarily a fan of consuming raw testicles, uh, which I've never done. So I don't necessarily know if there's benefit. I'm not going to eat raw brains, raw meat, maybe a little bit of steak tartare with an egg yolk on occasion. Mm -hmm. But for the most part, like eat your meat cooked, not overcooked. Um, Anybody that's ever cooked a liver, as you know, if you overcook liver, what happens to it? It becomes a fucking shoe. Yeah. It's awful. Yeah. I mean, I I remember the first time I made liver and onions, I overcooked the liver and it was fucking awful. So much so I threw it out and I've I've done kidneys. Kidneys are terrible. I'm not going to waste anything. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, But like there's definite benefit to consuming a very small amount of liver once a week, maybe one or two ounces. I say throw it in the freezer. There's also this fear of salmonella, you know, and you can get some bacteria. They say that freezing and eating it frozen limits the chance of that. Um, there was kind of conflicting information when I looked it up on that, but there is benefit. I think for the most part, um, anybody like I've consumed, like if you were to sit down and try to eat a raw steak, the, the chewiness factor and just the, the difficulty in just consuming it, like we are not designed to consume high amounts of raw meat. I mean, animals like, uh, my dogs do fine on it. We just don't have the stomachs for it. So it definitely benefits us. And that was Matt Steele. Like the bioavailability of the meat increases as you cook it. He, he did make a joke too that, you know, uh, um, Andy and Artie, let's say our common ancestor, like, you know, they were probably obviously eating meat at some point. Like they probably ate raw meat and then there was a big fire. Something got burned. They scavenged. They found cooked meat. They probably never ate raw meat again. A lot of questions here. I want to lead off with this. Like why has this individual hit with such a splash because of the shock factor because uh, if you look at the pictures well it's, or is it tiktok uh i think the guy's just polarizing and he's a cartoon i mean it, it, it's like watching a train wreck like i mean the guy looks like he smells awful i mean like i can smell him through the screen i'm like oh god this guy like he's got maggots in his beard um but i mean the other thing too is uh it's kind of disingenuous in that he's sitting there talking about this ancestral life but the dude obviously looks like a bodybuilder he's fucking juiced to the gills he looks like he's taking some form of melanotan. I mean, he's got his skin's extremely ruddy. And uh, uh, melanotan is an injectable peptide that actually brings out uh, like the pigment or I'm sorry, the mel- uh, uh, it's not melatonin, but it's, um, it's basically the, the, you know, the ability to tan in the system. I mean, Mark Bell took that shit for me. He still takes it. That's why he like kind of looks that reddish, kind of dark purplish color. Uh, so like he looks like he's taking a fair amount of pharmaceuticals. I mean, you just don't develop that physique like that unless you actually go to develop that physique. You're just not like ancestrally running in the round in the woods, carrying weird shit and developing like the way he's physically developed. I mean, that's kind of, you know, a more of a physique you would see within a bodybuilding template. I mean, if you want to see a compare and contrast, go look up some videos of uh, Erwan LaCour. Remember uh, MoveNet? Do you remember Erwan? So about the time CrossFit started, there was this guy who's a French guy named Erwan Lacour. And I actually wrote a letter for to the U.S. government when he was trying to get his uh, here we are. His, um, uh, his U.S. citizenship. M-O-V-N-A-T. Yeah, MoveNet. So Erwan is like an insane dude. And uh, um, like in, in, in a good way. And he has this thing called MoveNet. And the whole thing was about moving within nature. And if you look at how Erwan's built, he's built like a lot like what you would see from somebody who's moving through nature and training within an ancestral kind of model. Art Devaney, same thing. So they're not looking like liver king. The reason being, uh, it's extremely difficult to maintain that level of lean body mass and that muscle. So there's, you know, some interesting things happening behind the scene. Now, the bigger issue, if you think that this guy somehow like, uh, this evolved, I mean, it's a, it, it's a storyline. It's a cartoon. I mean, 100%. So you're telling me that this guy's been running around in the woods doing all this wacky shit. And then all of a sudden social media a year ago, he pops on and he's fucking eating raw testicles. Here's my second question, John. What's that? Kui Bono. Who benefits from this? Uh, He has a supplement company. Oh yeah. He has a supplement company. So eat raw meat, but buy my supplements. Feels a little weird, doesn't it? Feels like an odd deal. But I mean, if you have a million, uh, what we what we look up, one point four million followers on uh, on Instagram. I mean, you got a million plus followers, you got a pretty good chance of converting people. And the other thing is, is I think people are so soaked for 
leadership in so many ways that when you get somebody outside who's so polarizing, especially somebody that's like, hey, reclaim my life. This is what I look like. There's people that'll buy into it. Uh, I thought it was the same person, but after looking at this, it's a different guy that's attacking Kale. Like, what did Kale do? Oh, that's um, Paul Saladino, uh, Carnivore MD. I think they're in business together from what I saw. Uh -huh. But he's um, he's a, a clinician uh, who's gotten real big into this. Um, the bigger issue, and this is what I asked Matt on, there's no convincing research that talks about the ability to digest and more importantly absorb nutrients from raw meat opposed from cooked meat. So I think uh, Saladino stuff, especially about vegetables, where he's like, ah, eating vegetables is bullshit. It's not. I mean, there's definitely... Things with fiber and, you know, the uh, nutrients and especially cooking vegetables and making them more digestible. There's benefits to this. The problem is, is man, like the carnivore people are as wacky as the vegan people. So when you start pushing out on what we've always talked about on power athlete and especially, you know, with Rob and even with Matt is like, what's the middle of the road, least non crazy person diet. And, you know, if you eat a, a diet of real foods, you know, limit processed foods, eat proteins, carbs, and fats in moderation. And you keep an eye on total food or on a, a total calories. And if you're trying to lose weight, you are in a caloric deficit eating raw food. I mean, every bodybuilder in the world's got jacked off of eating a high protein diet and caloric restriction. How you skin the fats and how you skin the carbs is based on taste. And it's not that simple. The problem is people want somebody like the liver king to take a fucking spear and throw it in the ground and be like, you have to consume all this raw stuff. And then you put together this wacky cartoon nine tenths thing. And it just seems fucking. Well, take us back to the time when paleo first began. So you you and Rob Wolf pals, paleo solution so, and paleo. Yeah. So um, what's, what's wild on this whole thing is like I, you guys have heard me talk about on the podcast. 1999, I get introduced to Mauro De Pasquale, who had written The Anabolic and the Metabolic Diet. Mauro sends me his book and does my diet. In the book, he talked about a paleo diet. He called it a caveman diet. Uh, referencing um, uh, Vince Garanda, Stone Age diet, okay. right? So you go back to the 50s and even the 60s, Vince Garanda was a trainer in LA, trained Arnold and these guys, and he had something called the, the Stone Age diet. It was uh, basically a paleo diet with raw milk. I mean, so that's what he did. And Vince Garanda was fucking shredded back in the day. So he trained Arnold, trained all these bodybuilders. And Morrow, when he sent me his book, he talked about a paleo diet. He didn't call it a paleo diet. He called it a, a, a stone age diet. And I remember a like caveman diet. I want you to eat meat. Um, you know, where there's going to be fat. I want you to get fat from both saturated fat from animal sources and also coconut monounsaturated fat from olive oil. And he referenced, you know, the fact that there was a ton of research that talked about people that consume more olive oil within the Mediterranean diet, you know, better well being, mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, and then at the time we were doing a cyclical ketogenic diet. So there were no carbs during the week, but then on the weekends when we would do some carb stuff, there was more kind of, Hey, I want you to eat from this deal. But then there was also like, Hey, today I want you to go over and just eat as much pizza as you can handle. So there was balance within, it was probably an 80, 20 type of deal. And so when I met Rob, he comes over, <clears throat> this is actually at the CrossFit games. The first time Rob and I actually physically met, uh, we had emailed, he brought, came over and brought me a shirt, I guess they had made like one triple X at his gym, one triple X shirt that nobody bought. And for five years, they'd been trying to give away this triple X. And I was the only person he'd ever met to fit it. So he's like, Hey, we brought you a shirt. <laughs> so Rob and I become fast friends. He's like, Hey, have you heard about this paleo diet thing? And I was like, no, but I know what the paleolithic era is. So he starts diving into it. And I'm like, man, this sounds a lot like the diet I've eaten for most of my NFL career. And I talked about Mauro de Pasquale, at which point Rob's head fucking lit up and he was like, really if you know rob and rob's like fuck dude um and i you know i had already tested uh you know to have some form of gluten allergy and i knew i did and i'd have some a little bit of dairy allergy so i mean this stuff i just kind of naturally played into it and you know tom would do all my blood work and all my food testing and allergy and i remember that first time tom did all my blood work and we did my food allergy testing my comment to him is like what if i just eat all the foods that are green which were the ones I didn't react to. And Tom's like, if you can eat all those green foods, you'll be jacked. And it ended up working pretty well. So uh, fast forward, I meet Rob. We go through this whole thing. And I think Rob's like, holy shit, dude, here's somebody I don't have to convince on this thing because we had already eaten that way. Yeah. Um, but there was, 
you know, I mean, uh, growing up as a kid, I mean, we, like I said, we, we did liver and onions, um, you know, so, I mean, I remember we did try to cook kidneys and that was pretty awful. Anybody that's ever cooked kidneys, it just tastes like urine to me. That's what blows well, me even away. Even in done by professionals in Argentina, it still tastes like well, freaking piss. Well, when we were in Argentina, you remember they, they brought us out all those organ meats and entrails. Save la vaca. Yeah. Remember, and like they brought out that huge tray of that stuff. And as we dug into it, I mean, they cooked it so hot and it was so charred with so much salt that you could kind of muster through it a little bit with a bunch of red wine. But for the most part, like tripe, I mean, uh, dude, I've always been a huge fan of pate, which is another great way in terms of getting liver. Um, so I think there is benefit to consuming uh, raw liver, but I, I'm not going to necessarily buy off on the other stuff. And at the end of the day, like I'll never overcook a steak, but I do enjoy a cooked steak. But on occasion, we'll eat some raw, raw meat with uh, steak tartare, especially with an egg yolk on top. Oh, it's phenomenal. Mm-hmm. My quick take is... This is Charles. This is Charles. My quick take is he's the ShamWow guy for the brand. For their ancestral supplements, the fittest. He's the guy. And shout out, like offer Shlomi, who is the ShamWow guy. Legendary infomercial pitch man. Didn't he die of cocaine? No, no, that was Billy. Oh, was that the the guy oh, for yeah. the other uh, guy with Shamwell's in jail right though? No, for, no, the other dude had like uh, it was for the guy you know the thing which stops things from leaking. Yeah, Bill. The, the meme. No, no, there's a guy who's like, and wow, and he's like, he goes through the whole thing where the the spray on stuff can like st- keep a boat afloat. I know but, it's turned into a meme now. Oh, is it? Yeah, that guy died of cocaine. Um, yeah. But he's the pitchman. <sighs> well, he, pitch he, he he is. I mean, it's manufactured. It's like it's they bad. it's like they wrote together this script. And they found the right dude to go out and do this. And he's more than happy. Like there was a um, there's a meme page that fucking is harassing this dude that I found today. And they showed like a video of him that in New you York. Found it today? Like you started it? No, no. I actually clicked on when I was doing a little bit of searching, a little research for this. And uh, there was a video of him walking around New York City and these black dudes who were, you know, on the corner of New York City, like talking shit like, hey, what's up, midget? What the fuck? You know, because he's walking around with fucking without a shirt on. And he's got like a whole bunch of security crew around him and cameras. So, I mean, it's not like the dude's just randomly showing up. I mean, the thing, it's fabricated. Somebody with a marketing budget put it together and this guy's just playing his part. Yeah. It reminds me of Iron Man. Do you remember the the Manchurian? Yeah. Iron Man 3. He's the fucking Manchurian. Charles, who else is involved in this? So, we know we got... Uh, um, is there a whole cast of characters? Well, you got Paul Saladino. Is he involved in this too? I mean, uh, uh, Paul's in great shape too, but he's also a fucking tiny little dude. I mean, it you know, I mean, he carries a decent amount of muscle, and I mean, he. Uh, but yeah, I mean, this guy. I mean, dude, you don't get fucking abs like that. Just fucking a uh, ninja turtle. Yeah, you gotta have abs like a ninja turtle. Um, this, I mean, there's more people involved. This goes all the way to the top. Well, I mean, uh, there's a, a seriously marketing budget behind this. There's there's people that are putting this stuff and creating these storylines and putting this thing out. I don't believe that this, uh, um, yeah, like, yeah, like you know, like the Liver King is fucking producing this information. I mean, and and the brand looks pretty good. I mean, if you look at the uh, the labeling, you know, I mean, it looks pretty good. So uh, I think it's hard to kind of sell this ancestral thing with supplements. Um, but I mean, dude, the, if you look, the guy's in phenomenal shape, looks like a pro bodybuilder, um, other than his legs. I mean, but he's definitely fucking yoked in the upper body. I'm not mad at him for that. Another side note, you, uh, talked me into getting the black and blue. Before. Yeah, that's and been, that was the first time top five dude, steak I've ever had. First of all, Columbus. uh, that is how I eat all fillets. So what I'll do is I get a fillet. Ooh, uh, now we're talking. I, I put it in salt, like so I'll salt both sides, bring it up to room temperature. I get that cast iron butter pad pan nice and hot with a little bit of olive oil in there. And once it's steaming, I'll go like 60 seconds per side. And then that's perfect. So like on a nice filet, black and blue is the best way you get that nice char. I was actually there. There's this machine that I've been following on Instagram. I can't I'm not going to remember the name of it, but it's like the ones that you see at like dope like steakhouses where they, they cook it at like 1500 degrees. And so it's like a little machine basically hooks into your you know propane or, you know, whatever natural gas in your kitchen. And you can slide that thing in. You can cook it at like 1500 degrees. So, I mean, dude, black and blue done really right. What they'll do is they'll do like 
20 seconds, 30 seconds at 1500 degrees per side, and it comes out perfect. But I mean, uh, really a filet, I mean, something that's got a ton of muscle meat and not a lot of fat usually is pretty good black and blue. It's something like a fattier steak, like a, um, like a, a big ribeye, you usually try to do those reverse sear where you get them cooked all the way through to maybe 115, which is where I like it, 117. And then you just sizzle them and get a little bit of crust on the other side. But uh, I, man, I'm just, I think what happens today is that people are so devoid of heroes that they can create this entire, you know, fucking super, I mean, dude, like looking at the pictures, I don't know if those are Photoshop, but the dude looks fucking jacked. I mean, he's in, he's in legitimate contest shape all year round. And it's kind of hard to hold that level of contest shape, especially in your mid forties or these photos were all taken in a weekend and they're just distributed timely. Well, but he, he That's has how a lot of models work. Well, yeah. I mean, but he does have videos walking around and the guy is shirtless. I mean, he's fucking pretty yoked. I don't know how he, tall he is. He is he's oh yeah. No, I mean, he's, he's, like red, right? he's carrying, a t- he, he's carrying, he's carrying, well, yeah, he's super ruddy. Usually that's associated with either that Milano tan or you're taking a bunch of orals. So, I mean, he's on some form of gas, obviously. I mean, you don't get that level of fucking conditioning. Uh, you know, yes. I mean, there's people like all, all you have to do is take a look at some natural bodybuilding. I mean, there's guys that can carry and be that lean, but it's tough to carry that amount of muscle to and be that lean that consistently without taking something. Can we go back to steaks? Sure. Let's go. What do you got? All right. You got some questions? Well, we went to Columbus recently. Mm hmm. You went with the the tomahawk. Mm -hmm. So now I recently had a birthday, steak dinner with Pops. I didn't go tomahawk because I don't know. I I don't know why I didn't do it. But so talk to us about going to a steakhouse, open up the menu, and then ordering some cooked meats. So where where do your eyes go first? Mm -hmm. And then what helps you narrow down the decision? Do you ask for the special? Yes. Or just guide, let the menu guide you? So if you notice... Uh, when we went to dinner in Columbus, the first thing I do is I have banter with uh, the waitress or the waiter and the som- sommelier, right? We had, mm-hmm. uh, you know, the lady brought over. I made a wisecrack. Hey, where's the reserve list? Sent over. The sommelier comes in. That guy's got big personality. And at that point, you engage them and say, hey, what's the best cut of meat here? What do I want to eat? Because they know. I mean, like, if you show up to my house, you're going to ask and be like, John, what are we having? I'm going to cook you my best. I'm going to give you my best foot forward. And I know what I cook well and I know what's fine. And these guys are clued in on the kitchen, just like when the sommelier came over. I'm like, what, what do you have for us? And like, what would you recommend? And he, dude, he pointed exactly to what he thought was not only the best wine, but also the best value for the dollar. Mm-hmm. And uh, I think all too often people have this little bit of ego with these things like, oh, I'm going to go with this duck horn or I'm going to go with this and this and this. And uh, as we sat down and the guy, he, you know, he qualified me and he was like, oh, what kind of wines do you like? I'm like, well, we're on the wine list for uh, uh, Sea Smoke and then also um, Cinque Non. And I went through some of this. I'm like, my favorite wine's Abacus. And so, like, I threw out a couple names and instantly the guy knew, okay, this guy's not a complete fucking joker with wine. And uh, he made some really great recommendations. Pulled out the reserve reserve list. And then invited oh. you to go wine shopping with him next time in Columbus. <sighs> yes. And so that we... we, we Fast friends. We created a bridge. We made an ally. At which point, what steak do you recommend? So they had something that was pretty fascinating. It was actually a ribeye that they had soaked in bourbon for six days. Yeah. Way too rich for me. Way too. Uh, Josh from Train Road got that. He did. And he I told me to it. this day, this is the best steak he's ever had. For me personally, I like just cooked meat with salt. I don't like any sauces. I'm not a Bernays guy. I don't want any barbecue sauce. Like I want like. Uh, I want to taste the meat for what it is. It's kind of like um, going to eat sushi. How many times have you gone to eat sushi and watch people just literally douse their entire food in soy sauce? I'm like, dude, I didn't come here to eat soy sauce. I came here to eat the fish and taste the sushi. I want to taste that. I don't use soy sauce. Maybe a little bit of wasabi because I like to light myself up. But um, Sting granola. So, oh, it's so good. It's so good. Just like horseradish. But as we sat down, my uh, like, I always look... Like, unless they, like, if, um, you know, and I'll always ask, hey, like, what's the nicest cut of meat? What do you recommend? And if they say to me, everything's good, my go-to is a filet. Okay. Right? And I always get it black and blue. If they either you if they have either an 8 or a 12 ounce, I'll usually get the 12, depending on the price. If the price is too fucking astronomical, go get the 8. And I always get it black and blue for a filet. If they say to me, 
hey, we have a special cut. We have something, uh, whether it be a cowboy ribeye, it could be a bone-in uh, tomahawk, uh, might be like a Denver steak, or if they say anything really weird, like, hey, we got this cut. This is phenomenal. I usually always go with the recommendation, done medium rare. Unless they say, hey, get this thing rare plus. What is rare plus? Um, so you have rare, rare plus, and then you have uh, medium rare, and then medium rare plus. And those are kind of like, uh, I mean, uh, a medium rare should be like a 115, 117 internal temp. If you want it like 1, 108, 110, 112, that's in that rare plus. Uh, went to Papa's Brothers Steakhouse. Excellent, sh- showed Excellent you, choice. Showed you the pick. They Essentially, you can pick your own piece of meat. You can walk up to the counter, which is awesome. Yes. And uh, I misheard the waitress and almost gave my dad a heart attack because they had Japanese Wagyu beef like marbled. Mm-hmm. So this giant block of fat. Mm-hmm. And then I heard $24 per four ounces. So I was like, I'll take 12 and thought we could order like a deli meat. 240. And she was like, no, it's uh, $24 an ounce. Mm-hmm. So like essentially took the whole order and then came back and was like, are you sure? Are you celebrating anything special? I was like, yeah, it's my birthday. Cause she asked that question because I ordered so much of their. Yeah. You ordered $300. I know. Yeah. And uh, I was like, okay, no. And then I panicked and just took it aback. You should get like, uh, well, what's cool with that is you get like four ounces and you have them cut into one ounce pieces and then you can share it. Just because it's so uh, it's so rich and so decadent that it's almost like a dessert. You want just a little piece. Well, and, that's yeah. yeah. That's what she then pushed for for the table. Yeah, and my dad was like, "Yeah, like for something like that." And and I've had like really high end. We were in Japan and we had this insane wagyu. It was uh, fucking really expensive. And I remember we got just a few ounces and they cut it into little pieces so everybody could try some. And I remember thinking like that bite is all I'd want of that. It's too much. It's just like, it's so just like, it reminds me of just like a really decadent dessert. And um, so what I usually do is I, I always ask, hey, what's the special? Like the night we were, went with CrossFit where Lauren Glassman bought us dinner with the Kobe fucking Tomahawks. When the guy came around and said, when I asked him, hey, do you have anything special? And he goes, yes, we have these amazing Kobe Tomahawks. And I want to say they were $250 a piece. Damn. I was like, good. You were with us, right? No. Oh, Benny. That was, that and was Luke. That was Benny and Luke. Yeah. This so is the Papas. Excellent. So I actually said, hey, I'll get one of those. Luke and Ben go back and like, can we change our order? And then everybody at the table said, Well, I'll get one. We ordered it's 10. Like a Sam Adams commercial. Uh, well, <laughs> everybody had ordered and I was last. And I was like, Ah, do you have any specials? He goes, Actually, we have these amazing Kobe Tomahawks. I said, I'll take one. And then of course, Ben and Luke, who are smart enough to know. Yeah. To like resend well, their orders, go, hey, can we get that? And then the whole entire table changed. Well, here's my move at a steakhouse. Let John order first, then just do what he gets. <laughs> yeah. uh, I, uh, you know, and then I'm also big on the preparation. So I always ask, you know, how, how do they prepare them? Are they done this way and this? And I always want to know in the preparation, uh, probably the, the greatest prepared steak that I've ever had. There's a restaurant in Miami called Prime 112. And uh, we got a chance to sit at this table that like was right by the like right by the uh, the kitchen, uh, which for the most part people wouldn't want, but for me that was the best table. So we got to sit and I got to see how they cooked them. And what's cool is uh, they actually had these like little ovens and they were cooking them at like I think they were doing a reverse sear, so they had them at like maybe two fifty, two seventy five. So they threw them in, and then they put them in. Then they had this machine um, that was like this big. I, 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 I'll find it on Instagram, but, and then they put it in and they cook it like 1500 degrees on either side. So that it came with a crust and they put it on a hot plate and they brought it out. It was the best steak I've ever had was a prime 112. And, um, I got to see how they made it. And so the other day I was on, uh, Instagram and I, one of the, you know, tags I follow is like over fire cooking. Like, I think it's funny cause people follow these tags, like most of my tags and I know Charles is in the same deal. I'm really just interested in like interesting ways to cook steaks. Yeah. And, uh, um, you know, the, the one too, the, the one big thing too, and I think this is, I mean, it, it's gotten a lot better is, um, I think you got to have really nice cast iron pans. Like you what, gotta, th- this leads to my next question now. So you got your steakhouse strategy. More often you find yourself cooking amazing steaks at home. Yeah. Uh, so I think I can one? do it. So I do it in a few different ways. It depends on the cut of meat. 
like if I got to do something like a ribeye or let's say a, a tomahawk or I, I got a really dope cut of meat, I'll usually do a reverse sear. So what I'll do is I'll set up the big green egg, 250, and then I throw the thermometer in there and I'll basically, basically cook it over wood coals and the big green egg, bring it up to an internal temp of like 115, 117. I pull it off, let it sit for 10 minutes, bring out the cast iron pan, turn the heat up all the way, throw a little bit of like either butter. If, if the kids are, if uh, Cash is eating it, I won't put butter in because he's got a doubt. Uh, he doesn't, his blood sugar doesn't do well with the, doubt, with the dairy. And uh, so I'll use coconut oil or whatever it is. And then I basically sear it for about 30 seconds on either side. So this is technically the reverse sear. Yeah, the reverse sear. Oh, right. Because so, I've been at home with the pans, sear, then oven. So that's because I stole that move from you, but I guess I gotta. I always do the reverse sear. So the sear is is like, tss, tss, and then put it in the oven. Yeah, uh, I like it to do it the other way. I put it in the oven, bring it up to temp, and then I sear it on the other side to do the crust. So what do you? Here's what do you put it in the oven in? Is it just cast a iron st- pan? So and then you put the pan on, you turn and, that and heat then, up. Yeah. So so what I'll do is I'll put it in the cast iron pan. Okay. I pull it out, put it on a plate. Hit the clock 10 minutes and then at about three minutes in because it, it takes foil from coming out the oven or no? No. I okay. just lay, let it sit. And uh, it takes about anywhere from five to seven minutes to bring the pan up to the heat, heat that I need. So I'll, what I'll do is I set the alarm, 10 minutes countdown. At about seven minutes, I turn the heat on, throw a little, uh, make sure it's you know seasoned or I got a little coconut oil or butter, whatever I'm going to use. Turn it max heat and I let that motherfucker smoke. And then as soon as it hits 10 minutes, 30 seconds, maybe 40 seconds per side, depending on the, uh, d- depending on how big it is. Yeah. And then I bring it off and then that's it. And I, I like the reverse sear. Uh, if, if I got to do like a filet or, uh, something that's a little bit thinner, I'll usually do those on the big green egg and, uh, kind of cook them. I usually only do the reverse sear for things like that are, are real big, like, uh, like, a, you know, like a, a Kobe tomahawk kind of a deal or like a big bone in ribeye uh for, for thinner stuff my other one is i love skirt steak yeah so i'll do skirt steak i usually do that real hot and real fast i'll turn up the big green egg to like four 450 and i put those on there and i just kind of you know every 30 seconds keep flipping them until they're exactly what i want and i pull them off so I, and then what i'll do with the um with the skirt steak is the night before i put them in a big container with uh salt lemon juice and lime juice and maybe okay. a, and, and maybe a little orange juice and I soak them in there for at least 12 hours and then I pull them off and I cook those and that's like a crowd pleaser. So, yeah. Nice. Uh, the other one that, that I've been doing too. So, for the diet that I put together for myself and Hepton Stall, we've been doing a little bit of like carb loading, a little carb backing. And uh, so, what I end up doing is on Sunday, fasting. Like, uh, like not really fasting, just not eating breakfast or lunch and then I'll eat a big dinner. But what I did is I found the cast iron pan and I went and I started making cornbread. So I, I'll go to like Whole Foods or wherever and they sell those kind of prepackaged paleo gluten free, like uh, almost like pancake mix. Okay. Right. Those there's like Pamela's and a few other ones. All right. So I find one that's pretty interesting. And what I'll do is I, I mix it up. I'll usually throw like an extra egg or two in there. So it's a little fluffier, kind of get it real fluffy. And then I pour it in the cast iron pan and then I put it in the oven at 500 for 14 minutes. And then pull it out, and it like rises, and it's then like and then we cut pancake it. Pancake cornbread. Yeah, that's exactly <laughs> what it is. Pancake cornbread, and then I cut that up, and then that's part of my Sunday dinner, and then I'll cook a steak with that. Nice. And it's uh, it's phenomenal. In, is the steak in the same pan, or no? Uh no, because I'll use the little pan. Um, I got that little one for just the cornbread, but I'll. But what's wild is it's taken me like four years to get my big pan perfect, and I got that other littler butter pad recently, and I've been cooking pretty aggressive on it. And dude, it's coming off perfect, man. I really, I, I did a good job. So, uh, when you get the butter pad and they're brand new, they yeah. recommend the first thing to do is cook cornbread in uh-huh. the oven real hot. Dude, that was a game changer because I didn't do that on my first one. The first cooking on my new pan or on the big one was on the cowboy cauldron, and we were out there cooking on it. So I, I think that there's a different in a way to season, but like you know, making sure it's always clean and then. You know, after I wash it out, I'll put it back on the oven, turn it on. Once all the water's gone, put a little oil in it and let it sit. Yeah. Yeah. You got to like really do some nice work on those cast iron. But if you take the time, they literally will be amazing for life. For life. Hand me downs. Oh. Final question here. And this is, I feel I got pretty good at it, but elk, cooking elk 
through state classy meats. Yeah. We had some fun cuts with those guys. Um, and no, state, state classy is amazing. Like very, I didn't want to F it up. So yeah. I was very diligent and focused. So elk is so lean that you can overcook it and it turns into a shoe. So and actually. I would still eat it, but yeah, I didn't want. Dude, so I, I killed a pretty big Thule elk. Um, this is a couple of years ago. We were in California hunting up at uh, Tony Lombardo's place. And so I had all this dope elk, elk meat. And uh, I had a lot of opportunities to cook it poorly until I figured out how to cook elk, which was like real hot, real fast, sear, 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 and just go with it. And uh, actually undercooking it, like trying to undercook it was probably the best tip that I had. And uh, I remember the first time I cooked it like a normal steak and it just overcooked and it was awful. And uh, and then once I figured out how to cook it. So with wild game, usually a lot leaner than some of the uh, commercially raised stuff. So you just have to be very conscious. Venison, same way. Overcooked venison is terrible. So just making sure you just sear, sear, sear. Get it out the door. Yeah, I've had overcooked kangaroo as well in Australia. That sounds terrible. <laughs> yeah, the uh, man, I, there's a, um, I'm really, really impressed by people uh, that cook well. I mean, like my buddy Thad is an incredible cook and does an amazing job on the barbecue and he uses a big green egg. And every time we go over, he does an incredible job. Um, I'll, I'll tell you, the one thing that's been a real game changer for us is we have a, uh, we used our Amazon points to get uh, an air fryer. So we went through a few different versions of the air fryer. I think we finally found one. And so what I'll do is uh, I cook pork ribs. I'll cut them up like, you know, they come in those big slabs from, uh, from Costco. So I'll cut them into like each slab into thirds. So there's only like three ribs and then I'll cook them in that air fryer and they turn out pretty damn good. I can get them real crispy. So I definitely like doing ribs. So I found that I can do them in the oven and the air fryer is real good. Uh, I don't do real good with ribs on the oven unless there's a pan just because the, the, the fire. So that's why I don't cook lamb anymore in the oven or in the barbecue. Cause I basically destroyed my barbecue cooking lamb. Because yeah. lamb's just so greasy, just <laughs> forest fire. Yeah, I think I recall a uh, three alarm fire at the Summers household. <sighs> so what happened? I remember we did lamb burgers. I cooked them on my grill, and there was such a bad fire that actually the grate my grill broke in half, and my grill was done. I had to have this guy come out and like rebuild it and fix all the parts. And uh, as he was no, looking, yeah, those yours. Yeah, yeah, Luke also had a fire for a different reason. But. Yeah, he 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 looked at my grill and was like, "What happened?" I'm like, "Cook lamb." He's like. <sighs> destroys these things every time he's like you gotta use a drip pan i'm like fuck i know so we do lamb wasn't he like back ordered for like a year yeah the grill man yeah yeah during COVID, everybody decided to get their grills fixed because people were outside <laughs> fucking barbecuing uh now what i do with lamb burgers is i'll, I'll like uh, take mint or whatever's going to be in them i make them into burgers and i just put them in the oven uh like like in a raise with a drip pan and that's just way easier to cook okay noted i need those yeah no uh, i love lamb burgers tzatziki Oh, I do love me some tzatziki. The only problem with lamb is it totally fucks up my macros because it's so high in fat. So then I find like if Just I eat, eat lamb, raw liver, it'll all if, work if, out. if I eat them, then I got to eat chicken and I fucking hate chicken. I ate chicken last night in the crock pot. We cooked all this fucking chicken in the, uh, in the pressure cooker. Uh, and uh, it's just it's so bad. You got to like cover it with salt and, and yeah, whatever sauce. Like I have this, uh, this green, um, dragon? Not the green. No, it's not the green dragon. It's this fresh. Uh, green avocado salsa that they sell at Whole Foods in uh, over by the pickles and the the sauerkraut. Um, the expired pickles. Man, uh, <laughs> uh, I had a recently an issue with pickles, so I um you know we've been uh, Thorn wanted to hook us up with Dr. Huberman to get him on our podcast. So I've been listening to uh, Huberman's podcast, and he had a thing about fermented foods, which we've always been a big proponent of, like eating fermented foods. Uh, if you go back to Weston Price's deal, I mean, there were a few things that were universal to all the tribes that he examined. They ate fermented foods and they all ate organ meats and, and they, you know, there was no vegan uh, ancestral you know, group that he looked at. So we've always tried to search for different ways to eat fermented foods. And I used to eat Greek yogurt. I stopped eating dairy when uh, Cash got diagnosed with type 1 diabetes. We just got all the dairy out of the house. And so I've been eating sauerkraut and then I've been also getting these like fermented pickles. So I go to Whole Foods, I get them, I pop them open yesterday, and I'm about five pickles deep. And when I realize, I think the pickles are bad. I, I wouldn't, I just assume they taste that way because they're No, pickles. you, you kind of know. It's almost like there's like a weird kind of tingy soda taste to them. And uh, at that point, I like, was like, man, I think those pickles are bad. 
And then I got like my stomach just started sounding like making crazy noises. And I'm like, oh, I'll have to get rid of these in a few minutes. And uh, my wife's like, you okay? I'm like, no, I ate bad pickles. And she's like, how come you didn't know they were bad on the first bite? I'm like, because I wasn't paying attention. So I was five deep. Uh, so I threw those pickles away. I got a quick pickle antidote. College went to Subway with players on my team, buddies in line. And you know you can add your fixings as you want. Dude puts pickles on his sandwich and he asks, can I get some more pickles, please? Attendant stares him down and says, "You've had enough." <laughs> and just closes his sandwich. <laughs> this fucking dude had a bad day, I guess. But he's like, "No more pickles for you." So basically, a running joke for the past fifteen years. Still, it's been like, "No, no, no, you cut off on the pickles." <laughs> uh, dude, the amount of times I've been to In and Out Burger and I always ask for, "Can I get a side of pickles?" Uh, it's probably thirty percent that I actually get the pickles. So when I always ask, "Hey, can I get a side of pickles?" They never put them on there. And I always, and I'll get my stuff and I never ask, I'm like, hey, you fucking forgot my pickles. But I'm always going to spit in them. Well, with In N Out, when you go to In N Out, you can see what's happening because they have the fucking windows. So they can't fuck with anything. But uh, one of my buddies, one of the guys I played high school football with, um, I can't remember his name, but his nickname was Penny Whistle. Fuck. Yeah. So <laughs> I don't want to know that story. Uh, my, one of our coaches, who was our defensive coordinator, was a drunk. But he was also an English teacher, and he would get fucking. That'll happen. He would get hammered, and then he would come out to practice shit faced, and he didn't remember any of our names, so he just <laughs> gave us funny <laughs> nicknames. And I think the guy's <laughs> last name was Penlay, Penlay, yeah, Penlay, and somehow he ended up as fucking Penny Whistle. <laughs> and so what became funny is, uh, uh, God, his name was Dan. And what's funny too is we didn't even call him by his last name; I just called him by his first name. We were like Dan. And uh, he was like, God damn it. I can't even remember what my nickname was. Fucking, uh, but he like he fucked up everybody's name. And then whatever his nickname for you was, was just how we knew everybody. So we would roll in. And Penny Whistle worked at in and out So we used to roll up and like bang on the windows and be like, Penny Whistle. Penny. And he'd see Pickles. us. He'd, yeah, he'd be like, he'd give us like a, you know, throw us a bit. He'd be like, hey, I made you six by six. Like, yes. You know, when you're in high school, man, you get a six by six, you're fucking rolling. Oh, f- having pals that work at restaurants, that's how I'd make it through high school and college. Uh, I told you, uh, Brian Donahue, or no, Brian, no, Matt Donahue, um, he was on our crew team at Cal. He was the bartender at Henry's, which yep. was our local watering hole. And uh, he was in one, one summer, rhetoric of slapstick comedy. All of a sudden, these idiots show up. They're not rhetoric majors. One of my professors, and I see him. I'm like, what's up, man? He's like, dude, we heard that this was, we're just going to watch movies. I'm like, yeah, we got to watch movies and write fucking papers in a rhetoric style, which is going to be a ball buster. He's like, oh, can you help me? I'm like, I got you. So he and uh, these other two crew chicks ended up getting good grades, and I never paid for a drink at Henry's. So fucking Matt Donahue, would a fucking legend, legend. Yeah. Yeah, amazing, amazing individual for that. Yeah, goalie bartender. Me and you, guards, uh, and then I worked at the Tombs in Georgetown. So any DC folk know these. Yeah, yeah, those um, are good times. But uh, at the end of the day, uh, you you can go as deep as you want in terms of like meat consumption. You might just be a guy that just wants to go to H E B or the local spot and get something. Or if you really want to dive in, like there's like a you know state classy meats does an amazing meat box. Um, our well, neighbors just down in Shiner at Augustus Ranch do some of the best meat I've ever had. I actually have like a five pound uh, tenderloin filet that they gave me. Well, I'm pretty excited to cook. The guidance from Dr. Tom in terms of liver, like what the liver I was consuming was basically the, the, the freaking sponge of terrible cows bought at our local HEB, not quality. So essentially I was absorbing all the crap that the cows were eating. And that was what led to my issues with it. So the, so, so the guidance was did, high quality liver as you could find. Did Tom think that some of your issues came from the fact that you're eating lower, like from a lower quality animal? Uh-huh. Oh, interesting. Um, you know, State Classy has always provided this liver. or not always, but recently, uh, last couple of years. And then also when I was down at Augustus Ranch uh, meeting them, uh, they threw me in a ton of, I, I got testicles from them. I got heart and I got liver. And so normally. Any tongue? I did not get a tongue, but I, I, I do owe you a tongue. JJ Watt. Uh, I, so with testicles, normally what, the way I cook them is I put them in a crock pot and we'll do them in like a crock pot, like with, uh, some form of like, um, what do you call it? Like a salsa verde. 
yeah. like the green salsa verde or you can do barbecue sauce or something. And you just set them in there for whatever the long on the crock pot is, which is like eight hours. And they're pretty good in that situation. I've never tried to like cook them in a pan and fry them up. I've always done them that kind of slow. And I got that from Kevin Doherty, uh, my roommate in college. Uh, Doe was uh, from, you know, Central California, which is as country as Texas. And uh, we came back and he had a whole fucking bag of testicles. And I think they were sheep nuts. And we cooked them in a crock pot with barbecue sauce and they were fucking great. Um, heart, I also do in the crock pot. Uh, what I'll do is I'll cycle it through for, you know, whatever the long is on eight hours. I'll put like salt and water and make sure that it's, you know, basically covered in water. And then I let it sit on warm for an entire 24 hours. So I cook, or I'm sorry, for another 16 hours. So I'll do it like an entire day. And then what happens is, is that, that, uh, the meat's real stringy and you can kind of cut it and put it into strips. And then we make it into, uh, into, into tacos. Our tacos are amazing. So if you ever get a chance to eat babacoa, what they'll do is they boil a cow head and then they pull the meat off the face. That's a pretty damn good one too. Real tender. Um, man, I'm such a fan of meat and different ways to prepare it. And, and I think you just have to be creative and there's so much information on YouTube and also on like Instagram and Charles is like constantly forwarding me stuff. And we have these different tags I follow. It's pretty cool to see what people cook and more importantly, how they cook it. And there, there isn't a day that I don't see something where I think shit. I wish I was there eating that right now. So, um, all right. To re- recap, uh, if you're at a restaurant, definitely ask the waiter or the sommelier or somebody in charge what the best cut of meat is and then go with their recommendation. Uh, don't believe the hype. And uh, I think that the bioavailability and the, the nutrient density increases when you start eating cooked meat. And if you want to throw a little raw liver in, go for it. Just make sure you freeze it. Yes. And how about our nutrition services that power athlete provides ah if you're interested in maybe getting coached and allowing us to take you on the journey take a look at uh, powerathlete.com or powerathletehq.com slash nutrition there's a tab at the top if you go to powerathletehq.com and you can click on uh sam and uh, rob do an incredible job in taking their clients on journeys that they can't necessarily take on themselves so Uh it's pretty amazing yeah and we have some awesome recipes Mm -hmm. on the website as well Yes, yeah, Sam and Rachel are doing a kick-ass job in terms of providing recipes. Uh, that is 100% makes my heart warm. Like I know like in terms of like performance and you know this and everything and then you know, you guys provide recipes. It's because I cook every single – I mean I, like we eat out one night a week. I eat one meal out, everything else I cook. So, well, I mean I cook uh, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. I do my own f- uh, food prep. I'll tell you, uh, I know Matt Vincent's hooked up with like a food prep company. I would always love to have just, well, I don't know. I mean, I, I go back and forth. It'd be nice if just like a box of food showed up and you didn't have to think about it. You just ate that food. But I also feel like it's kind of like, uh, it's good, but it's also a little bit lazy for me. And like in, in not in a bad way, but I, I like the effort of cooking my own food. I like the idea of like getting my pan perfect. I like the idea of trying new things. And more importantly, getting new cuts of meat. I take the, you know, I mean, I, I don't necessarily post it on Instagram because I'm real weird about posting my kids on Instagram just because there's a lot of fucking perverts in the world. Are you a mindful eater? In the what way? Preparation helps you mindfully eat. Uh, I like to be connected to where my food comes from. I like to know where it comes from. I want to know the ingredients and I want to know the method. Um, it's just, I don't know. I, I think it's important. I think we're we're so like willing to take other people's word for it. And, um, you know, there's some really dope restaurants around here in Austin. I really love the farm to table stuff. So, uh, but yeah, my son, uh, there's a, a Espetos, the, uh, um, Argentinian steakhouse is like his favorite spot. Uh, so he like last night, you know, I asked him, I'm like, Cashy, what do you want after uh, flight football practice? He's like, can we go to Espetos? I'm like, no, first of all, it's a Wednesday night. It's six o'clock and it's you and me. What are you just going to like, we're going to go to Espetos without your mom and your sisters. He's like, yeah, so no, but I did take him over to Whole Foods and let him pick which kind of meat and I'll cut it, I'll cook him that tonight. So I, I'm like, which, what do you want? And he like, like looks and then I go ask the lady, ask, what, is this a good cut? Which one do you, you know? And I think it's just a, there's a process of being connected to our food. Yeah. Like when we went down to, I, I, I got to bring him down to the Augustus Ranch. That was so cool. And we still owe the guys to stay classy a chance to go, I mean, to go up and, and tour their farm. I, I really enjoy seeing where the meat comes from and actually supporting companies that do a good job of this. Mm-hmm. 
a lot of opportunity for learning, challenge, uh, and guess, and dig a little deeper for what you see on the internet. Yeah, I mean, I don't believe that the Liver King has amassed that physique through his nine tenets of ancestralism or whatever he calls it. I mean, like, if you look at that, like, that is a, a you know, definitely the physique of somebody that's crafting within the bodybuilding deal. And that's fine. There's a ton of dudes that look like bodybuilders and he looks better than 99% of the world. But if you want to see somebody who looks more like you would imagine, like if we were to go back in time, you know, a thousand years and find our, uh, you know, ancestral paleolithic, I mean, even though paleolithic era was much longer than that 40,000 years ago. But if you went back in time and you saw paleo man, they wouldn't look like Brian Johnson, AKA not the lead singer of ACDC. So I suppose we can help guide if your goal is to eat more organ meats, to look more ripped and jacked. I think our power athlete nutrition coaches can do an excellent job. I think it'll work. And if you're trying to look like you would in somebody with an ancestral kind of deal, I mean, look at the hunter gatherer tribes You can click on Weston price or, you know, click on, look at move net and Juan Lacour. Like there's a dude who's legitimately looks like somebody that's living. I'm going, I don't think Brian Johnson's going to be able to make it very far. If they were to put him out in the wilderness, I mean, I know he went down to Africa. We saw the pictures, or I don't know, maybe he was in Texas and he just had African actors following it. I don't know. I also want to know if he did go to Africa. What were the African people thinking when he goes over there and is basically trying to rip the nuts off of some animal? Was that a video? I don't know. I mean, fuck. I think the guy showed up with a spear. I mean, they're probably like this idiot smells terrible, <laughs> but. I mean, uh, I'm wondering about his hygiene. You think he washes that beard? I mean, he shaves his body. I mean, you're not going to have that level of beard and not have some severe body hair. So he is shaving his body. He's also taking something. I mean, he's super ready. So it's either some form of orals or that Milano tan stuff. I remember, I remember Mark Bell told me the first time he took it, he took too much and like turned fucking like dark red purple. So that'll happen. Yeah, don't want that to happen. So. Well, guys, hey, if you have any more questions or you're interested in our take on anything, we've got this thing called Power Athlete Hotline. Like I said, 929-464-464. 929-ing-ing-0. Zero. You can text us. You can uh, leave messages however you want to do it. And if you want to send text some, uh, some dong pics, <laughs> no. maybe an occasional peach pick, uh, he'll love it. What's a peach pick? The booty. Oh, sure. Like today we were ass, working. Hashtag ass mess. <laughs> Like today, we were working on uh, pulling some deadlifts and doing a bit of a little booty action. And I was like, man, you got a hashtag peach. That's hashtag as, ass mask. I own as, that. Uh, uh, as uh, Jen Wiedersham told me, you got to pop that peach if you really want to do the social media thing right. Matt Vincent's doing it right. He's just popping that peach. Yeah. So Hashtag ass mask. You can see a lot of my work <laughs> out. Well, you know, I mean, short king, you know, I mean, the thigh meat's got to match the butt meat and you got little short getaway sticks. I do have getaway sticks. Uh, I'm quick, I'm not fast. The also, I don't want to say it. My uh, ghost handle is connected to Short Kings. <laughs> well, from uh, from the Short Kings that I work with, thanks for tuning in another episode of Power Athlete Radio. Bye. Bye.